Hello everyone. For this episode of Video Game Book Club, we looked at 8-Bit Apocalypse, The Untold Story of Atari's Missile Command by Alex Rubens. This is a really interesting book in some cases. In others, I think, you know, he, Alex probably could have left some stuff out. But for the most part, I think it's a really good uh, look at how video games were developed back in the early days of Atari specifically looking at arcade games. He doesn't go too much into console games, which is kind of understandable, but for the most part it does a good job of talking about arcade development. If you're looking to compare uh, the way games are developed now and the way they were developed back in you know the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, this is a good way to kind of start you off to give you a baseline of how video games were originally made. It's Again, like I said earlier, it's not a not a perfect book, but I don't think there is one out there. There's definitely some things that, at least from my perspective, didn't really fit with the way the book was, at least with the narrative that was being built. But overall, I don't think it really deterred too much from it. I'll talk about that later on. But first, let's get started. This is, this follows the story of, obviously, Missile Command and its uh, original developer, David, and I'm going to totally butcher his name, uh, Therer, I think? I don't really know exactly how to pronounce that, but um, either way, he had kind of a set goal that he wanted to do. I'll just refer to him as David, that will probably work better. David had a kind of a message he wanted to get into Missile Command, when he was first given this project, it was it was different from the way that it turned out to be. And the way it kind of worked back in the day is Atari's arcade division, the, which is where David worked, the person running it would kind of get like an idea from seeing something someplace else, and go to the developers and say, hey, make a game about this. And that's kind of how Missile Command got started. Uh, David's boss was told, make a game that kind of looks like a radar screen and is about missiles. Now, it was based on a magazine article, but it, it's kind of like a sketchy thing. Which can work for games back then, specifically because you didn't really need too much for an arcade game. You just needed a, usually a joystick, a couple of buttons, a spaceship. You don't really need to know the story, you just know that the people on the other end of the screen, they're coming to kill you. Or... In some cases, you just need Pac-Man, and you need to gobble up all the pellets, and the ghosts are coming to get you. That's really all you needed. But for Missile Command, David wanted to fit something else in there. He was really worried about a uh, nuclear war, as the Cold War was going on at this time, and it was in the late 70s, early 80s. It was getting to some of the hotter points. It, uh, it went through sort of like some cools and some hot spots, and the sort of fear of nuclear war was really, really prevalent throughout our society at that time. And David wanted to create something that kind of captured the way he was feeling about it. Specifically, he was really, really afraid that one day he was, uh, for example, a dream that he has in here, he's on a hike and all of a sudden he just sees like missiles coming down. And that was a dream he had and it was kind of scary. I mean, even today it's a little kind of freaks people out a little bit when they talk about nuclear war, or we see some cases of like, hey, this is what happens when a nuclear bomb drops. It's a pretty scary thing to think about. Uh, it's kind of dulled down a little bit, but for the most part, it's it's still there. And after the Cold War was over, society kind of moved on from that. Uh, it's a little kind of a crazy thing to look at, and I don't want to go too deep into that history. but. David was really worried about it, and he went about creating Missile Command as sort of a no-win scenario that would still be kind of fun for video game players to play. And you have to think about the time that he's making these arcade games, there's normally no way to win in an arcade game. You get the kill screen if you're good enough, and that's over. The game, you just can't keep going at that point. But with Missile Command, he wanted to create that sense of the enemy is constantly attacking you, you have no way to actually kill the enemy that's attacking you, the only thing you can do is try to save the cities. And I should explain a little bit of Missile Command for the people that don't know that know about the game. 
A missile command is set up where you have six cities and you have three missile silos. And each missile silo can be controlled independently of each other. I'll get into a little bit of that explanation in a minute. But you have missiles raining down from the sky and your job is to shoot those missiles out of the sky with your own. Now, you can have a few different strategies for this. You can try to save all six cities or you can pick one city that you want to defend and just kind of say screw it to the other five. It's kind of a weird way to look at it, but no matter what you do, eventually you're going to lose. The missiles are going to come too fast, there's going to be too many of them, and you're not going to be able to stop them all. And that's kind of the craziness of Missile Command. You can't stop the missiles from coming at you, but you also can't really do a whole lot of anything else except for try to shoot down the incoming missiles. That's the basis of Missile Command. There's a, a few more things, but they're not really overall that important to the game. The way the arcade cabinet was set up specifically is you had a trackball, which is just like a little mini bowling ball about, about that big around, give or take and you have three buttons. Those three buttons controlled each of your three silos. So you would move like a cursor around on the screen with your trackball and you would just pinpoint where you want the missile to be shot and it would go up and detonate and take out the incoming missiles. I'm actually really bad at Missile Command but that's because I don't think I've ever played it on an arcade cabinet. I've only played the PC versions and the controls were never really explained to me, but that's that's besides the point. Missile Command is one of those classic Atari games that anybody can pick up and play at any point. They did make home console ports and everything, but if you try to play with a joystick, it's just not that great. You really needed the trackball controller for it, which Atari did release later on. But it was just one of those weird things where you know, it, it goes to the home port, but personally I didn't, I don't really find the home ports that great. If you really wanted to experience it, I would say the arcades were probably the best way to do that. that that's besides the point, though. So, uh, when David made this, it was like his first solo project at Atari, and that's kind of what Atari did. They would throw their uh, first-time developers, they would throw them a project, and they would say, you have six months to complete this. That sounds pretty crazy, but that's mostly like mo more modern mindsets looking back at the way games were made back then. You didn't really need more than one or two people making an arcade game back then. They just didn't have the same scope. If you look at the graphics, you can kind of see there wasn't a whole lot that you needed to do when you compare the older games to this one. It still took like an enormous amount of work. They still had what was called the crunch, where you would work like 12, 16 hour days on your game, but you didn't need like a full team of like 20 or 100 people to make this. So while it sounds really daunting, it, it wasn't as bad as it is today. That six month time window is, is still pretty crazy to me just to think of them like actually making the hardware and everything for this game and making sure all of that stuff worked. I'm not sure if that six month included the actual completion of it, like complete the uh, the prototype, get the initial board made, and then test out that board to make sure it works. That would sound a little bit more unreasonable to me. But if it did include that, that would make it just even more insane that these guys made these. I'm fairly confident it was just like the programming for that six month period. If it was talked about that in the book, I missed it, and I'm sorry about that. So, yeah, sorry. <laughs> but um, it goes into that a little bit. And then it also go one thing I found super cool is that Alex uh, addresses like some of the conspiracy theories for arcades at the time and everything, and kind of comes up with a very logical explanation for all of them. Because they had to test market the arcade game and everything. So you would have like multiple versions of arcade games coming out and they would get test marketed. So you might have a game that says like Space Fighter or something and it would just like no artwork, just a black uh, arcade cabinet and you would have like a couple of people sort of watching the arcade cabinet and like 
taken down notes like, okay, this person like seemed to enjoy this, this person seemed to enjoy this. And that's could sound pretty creepy, like you're a kid, you're playing an arcade game, there's some there's like a group of weird guys writing down notes about what you're doing. That could kinda of make it seem like, hey, the government's watching me and they're like trying to do some weird stuff with this arcade cabinet. But no, it was just Atari and other game companies just test marketing it. And they wouldn't like bring people in to do it, which would probably make a lot more sense, set up an arcade cabinet and bring kids into play and then just sort of watch it between, uh, watch them from like a two-way mirror or something like that. No, they would bring them to an actual arcade and they would just set the machine up. And yeah, it sounds kind of weird when you think about it back, think about it now, but that's the way they did it and it's, it's a little crazy. But yeah, that, like I didn't, I didn't really think about that until like all this was written down. I knew that they did test markets for arcades, but I just didn't know like I never actually saw it written down in a book like this. It was just kind of cool to read it, and it sort of explains, okay, yeah, so you'd be playing, and there'd be people taking notes, and obviously you'd think, oh, okay, is like what the hell is going on? Anyway, like that was really cool. And also, uh, they talk about some of like the modifications they made to the arcade cabinet and whatnot. And they talked about the pricing, and I think that's a little bit weird that they that they talked about it. Cause I, like the arcade cabinet cost uh, eight hundred and seventy one dollars. Just say like somewhere between a thousand and twelve hundred with labor and everything like that. And so they were still looking to get the prices down on it and everything. Which is really crazy to think about, because they would produce these games, and then they would give, they would sell them off, and then they would try to like, or they would put them in like their own dedicated arcades or something along those lines. But you're thinking they're trying to get all their profit back quarter by quarter. So if nobody's buying or nobody's playing these stupid things, you're down like twelve hundred bucks if you bought this, or probably more than that, because they would obviously want to make their money back. It's just insane to think about that. Like they're trying to get this huge cost back quarter by quarter. Uh, that's just something that blows my mind when when I think about it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of a lot of the stuff that I really liked about this. They also go through um, David's uh, motivations for his the next game he did, which was Tempest that he worked on, where he was kind of worried about monsters coming to get him as a kid, and so he sort of created the game the way it is with like a where like uh, monsters would come out of something to get at you. That one's kind of weird and everything. I don't really know why we started talking about Tempest, but we did. And we don't really go into the next game that at least David's credited with, which is iRobot. And I couldn't find a lot on this game when I looked it up because it's not really mentioned in the book, but when I looked up David to kind of figure out what he was doing now, uh, I didn't really see a lot of info on the development of iRobot. But Missile Command and Tempest were very pop they were very popular for Atari, they were very profitable. And something weird kind of happened with David, he just sort of... I think it was after the uh, crash, because the, the video game crash is mentioned in here, but... It's, it's one of those things where he didn't go very far into it, and I wish they had, because I, I think that's some of, that was probably some of David's uh, ideas, like, hey, I need to get out of this business and move on. And he did. He still does uh, stuff with electronics today. I can't remember exactly what he does, but he did receive a Pioneer Award in 2012 for his work on Missile Command, which is pretty cool. I'm, like, I'm glad he got recognition for it, since... When he was making these games, Atari really didn't give any recognition to the people that were making them. Even in the even in the uh, arcade division, which I I still find that really weird that Atari just didn't really care about the people that were making them all of their money. It's very bizarre to think about that. So that's pretty much everything that I really liked about this book. The stuff that I didn't like about it, um, the fact that we talk about Tempest in this when. The book's not really about Tempest, it's supposed to be about Missile Command and about David Thayer, which I think the book should have been more about him and everything like, than that. It, it is about him, but I think it should have been more about him. Uh, the fact that, we're tr that we tried to tie Missile Command to like modern-day events, where I don't really think 
there's like a real parallel between the two. I, I mean, I could see what uh, Alex was going for, but it, it kind of felt a little weird, and I, I didn't personally like that part of the book. Uh, there are a few issues where, like when he tries to tie it, he spends an entire chapter trying to tie it to a modern day events. He does a few other things where I'm like, why are we talking about this? And there are a few instances of like repetition of things where it's like, okay, why are we talking about this again? It's like you established this like previous chapters, why are we reiterating it? Again, that's just my own personal take on the book. Some other people that are reading it could have their own. I mean, I understand that as well. Uh, there's a few other things where I'm like, okay, great, but I wish we had some more behind, like, uh, Thayer, David uh, Thayer's motivations for getting out of the gaming industry. And the other person that they bring up that helped him, uh, Adam, I wish we went into more of his story as well. This is where I think it could have been more, um, more uh, sort of like back and forth between the two of them while they're developing uh, Missile Command. I think that could have worked on a little bit more, maybe seeing where uh, Adam went after this and seeing how that was either different or similar to the way Thera did, or Thera's career went. There's a few other things that I think could have been done with the book, but in the grand scheme of things, it's very, it's, it's very well written. Very, it's laid out, for the most part, very well. Uh, I wish that the video game crash had been expanded on. I wished um, sort of the initial few chapters on Atari's history had kind of been dialed back a little bit, because I don't think that they were really all that necessary. But... Yeah, I could see, and if it was worded differently, and if it was laid out a little bit differently, it might have uh, might have given me a bit, little bit of a different perspective. Anyway, I, I really do recommend this book. If you read this along with uh, Significant Zero by Walt Williams and also uh, Blood, Sweat, and Pixels, these I think these three books, Ape, Ape Apocalypse and the other two that I've mentioned they would definitely sort of give you a good idea of how video game development has changed, uh, the toll it takes on the people that make these games for us, and just sort of give you a better understanding and kind of a... It, it might give a few people some more respect for the, for the people that make these games. And generally when you see a bug in a game, people are sort of like, ah, oh, how the hell could they miss this? And then when you find out all the story of how the game is made, you're kind of like, okay, it's because these people are like working themselves to death in order to bring these games like about and everything like that. And that's kind of a bit of hyperbole on me, but it, they're de it definitely takes a toll on you from what I've read. And yeah, it's, it's really, really, I'm really thankful that these guys are actually doing it. So yeah, if you guys want, uh, let me know what you think about this in the comments below. If you've read the book, I'd love to hear your opinions of it. And definitely, if they're different from mine, let me know. Um, if you guys like the video, please let me know. If you hated it, also let me know. Anyway, I will talk to you guys later. I think the next book I'm going to read is another one by uh, Jamie Landino. It's called Breakout, and it's talking about Atari's computer division. Kind of on, a, kind of on an Atari. Uh, thing right now. I'm not really too sure why. Anyway, I will talk to you guys later, and have a great day.